G. Uh, who's still in the room? Uh, hands up. Uh, CIOs? You're still in the room, I can see you. Uh, CIOs? Uh, marketing, chief marketing officers, mix, um, chief digital officer, couple, uh, many uh, entrepreneurs working out of their garage on the new next wave. Not, yeah, uh, which talks to the issue, right? Um, so I know you know who uh, we know who you are, but uh, a little bit uh, about me. Uh, thanks to the intro, uh, I run Enterprise Architects, uh, a business hopefully known to. Some of you, and I see some familiar faces in the room. Uh, for those that don't know, we are a strategy and architecture uh, professional services firm, and we do operate around Australia and in London and in uh, office in, the New in New York. So uh, the things that we do are to interact with organisations, and especially in the context of every strategy is now a digital strategy, and that brings us into play for organisations, either to help them to form the strategy or we pick it up after the digital strategy has been formed and can you now help build the architecture which will bring this to reality. So we see a lot of this and some of it is really cool and some of it's kind of, oh yeah, okay, I guess that could be a digital strategy. So hence uh, the title, you know, is this really about dis digital disruption or is it just kind of the next evolution of the use of technology to be better at what we do today? because frankly, that's uh, what we see a lot of. So coming through. So, okay, you've heard today to death and one of the benefits of speaking very late in the day is that you will have heard everything uh, and that's fine uh, because I didn't really want to elaborate on this. Everyone understands that, you know, fundamentally it's the internet of everything, social media and social channels, cloud uh, and data retention and analytics, be it big data or anything else, because big data is overhyped. Uh, basically you're saying, well, look, these are the elements of digital strategy. So if I have this and I put this into my plan, have I nailed my digital strategy? Yeah? Someone at the outside the room said, no, that's great. So look, the, this is sort of a rhetorical question. And uh, in our world, I see so much which doesn't kind of talk to me about uh, digital thinking, digital strategy as I know it. It talks to me about evolution. And you know, these are some examples. You know, airline, we're minimizing passenger touch points uh, from terminal entry to boarding of the plane, okay? So the use of technology, emergent technology, so that we can streamline the process, probably in a customer you know, centric way, in the view that if I can minimize the number of touch points uh, from the time they get in the terminal, onto the aeroplane that I've done something customer centric and that's really cool but well actually isn't that just a process efficiency play you know there is actually not a lot in there that's doing uh, much to sort of shift the customer perception and if anything has the potential to actually have a negative impact on customer perception because every time I walk into the terminal with a different airline, I've got a different way to get through and, and the old habits die hard. If I'm a frequent traveler, that can be fabulous. If I'm not a frequent tra traveler, that can be a real uh, pain. In business banking, we're giving our bankers mobile access to client data, history and analytics, all right? The, the premise being that for the business bankers, if you make the business banker better at doing their job, does that not translate into better customer service and therefore uh, the ability to you know, provide a better experience for the customer? Well, yes, it does. But you know, to be honest, isn't this just a mobility strategy? And doesn't every business today have to have a mobile first uh, model? Doesn't every business today have to be able to provision its workforce with the ability to have the access to information that it should have if it was working in the office environment? The answer is yes, all right. You know, retailers, you know, we've implemented the online store. We're allowing purchase via a smartphone app and or other uh, mediums, all right. Isn't this, is this digital strategy? The reality is this is a channel strategy for an organization that's saying I can have access to another channel and in any organization you would expect this to occur. And this is the case. 
I should understand my uh, alternate channels. I, if I'm a BRICS organization, I should also have then a complementary uh, strategy. And this is, these strategies are not unique. Every retailer probably has this as a strategy. It's just, what's my implementation approach? One that's been getting a bit of airtime in the last few weeks, certain uh, bearing manufacturer, um, widely reported by most analysts. Uh, you know, we're putting sensors on bearings to improve maintenance scheduling. And you go, all right, gee, internet of everything. I've just instrumented a bearing. This is just an instrumentation strategy. And every, uh, every plant or high capital intensive industry with a lot of plant has been instrumenting stuff for 20 years, one way or another. All right, the fact I don't have to have wires connected to it to get the data is neither here nor there. The fact that I've broken it down to a more atomic part, you know, is pretty cool. But at the end of the day, I'm doing something that's been done before. I'm just coming to a different level. This is just instrumentation. It's what I do with it is the kind of interesting part. How do I make this change the game? And then, the, you know, the classic and the last, you know, um, health insurer. Plenty of them. And when they go to launch new product, all right, what's the demographic? We're shooting for young guys or girls, you know, the, the, the teenage community or the young adults. All right, we're launching this new product and we're going exclusively with a uh, social media campaign to get this market out, to get this product out into the market. Okay, isn't that today just a marketing strategy? What marketing organization today does not have to you know, be very, very uh, socially, social media uh, aware and have that as a fundamental part of their strategy. So these are all part of the digital discussion today, but in many ways they are just de rigueur. They're the thing that you have to do to make uh, your business a success or to compete in any shape or form. So key point, you know, we talk about disruption important point here is uh, it's been described and uh, you know it's always good to refer to somebody else's definition rather than your own because somehow that gives a greater credential but this whole concept of you know disruption in business has always been around it's always been centered on uh, innovation and the adoption of technology potentially uh, with a view to creating new uh, services or tackling new markets that's really great what does it mean in the context of digital and, and this time I referred to the Australian Digital Transformation Lab, but there is a concept here of, you know, this is the way in which we change the way in which we create uh, value within and across markets. And this is the key point. And that a digital strategy that ultimately isn't tackling that issue probably isn't really seeking to change the game. It's trying to optimize what we do today. I'm either trying to be more efficient I'm either trying to make people more effective uh, in their role out in the market. I'm trying to improve my marketing because there are channels I just have to tackle because they own all the eyeballs, uh, but I'm not disrupting. I'm disrupting when I change uh, you know, the value proposition or I tackle new markets. So this is a, these are really important concepts to keep in mind. So then we deal with this age old issue. You know, why do the incumbents struggle to disrupt? And it's the same discussion about why do incumbents struggle to innovate at all. And this is not, you know, a 2015 problem. This has been a problem for business since Tom Peters was a boy and wrote books on, uh, on business, that uh, innovation is a challenge for large corporates. And, and why is that? And the key thing here is that ultimately this comes down to uh, human behaviour inside large corporates. And we see this all the time, and it's really interesting to watch the behaviours. You know, ultimately, uh, revolution represents risk for large businesses. And the whole concept of going uh, and tackling a strategy which has uncertain outcomes is not a natural and comfortable home for most uh, organisations. All right? Um, it's an interesting thing. Um, you know, we go and talk to a lot of businesses, and uh, many will say, yeah, we're, um, you know, we like to be on the leading edge or we like to be a really fast follower. And do you know what? Most businesses have multiple speeds and that's been kind of widely reported. And, you know, recently we were with one business that openly declared, no, we are actually um, a slow follower. We will actually watch everybody else stumble and fall and we will pick up the things that work and then we will compete for a share of the market based on something that we've seen. 
And to actually have a business declare that as their position on uh, strategy and innovation is really unique. But most businesses actually resist risk. It's a natural behavior. And the bigger the organization, the more stakeholders, uh, this is the natural course. This, of course, does not apply to startups in garages who are innovating because they've got nothing to risk. They go for it. And uh, so, you know, ultimately, uh, risk becomes uh, an impediment. More importantly, the people involved, you know, are bankers and manufacturers, product managers, marketing people, and they are not digital entrepreneurs. Uh, interesting discussion. Uh, uh, someone was uh, telling me um, uh, of an organisation that was uh, actively trying to clean out all, you know, earlier in T-shirts and jeans. Tough thing to do, you know, highly contentious, but uh, with a view that says in a digital age, you know, we need to shift, uh, shift gear. I was reflecting, I was at a certain uh, conference um, uh, late last year and uh, reflecting that there are a lot of people up talking about digital strategy and what it means to uh, pursue digital strategy. And they were a lot of old men like me, I can say that, uh, telling a lot of people um, you know, dressed in t-shirts and jeans what the digital strategy should look like. And I thought that was slightly ironic. I would have felt a lot more comfortable if there were a lot of people up in jeans and t-shirts you know, at 25, 26 years of age, telling a lot early uh, old men in suits uh, what uh, the world of digital should look like. You know, naturally, uh, there is not an empathy to be shifting gear when you've spent your life building banking products or manufacturing a certain product or, you know, working in product management. This is not a natural transition. The natural skills don't necessarily exist or the natural mindset uh, doesn't necessarily exist. And we, we talked a lot about left brain, right brain uh, earlier with our friends from digital, and I actually concur. Big organisations, and I know what it's like to actually try and get uh, innovative strategies up. The challenge is that you go into a room, and there'll be 20 people in that room, 20 people need to concur in order to get one step forward, right? You've got to have everyone in the room to agree before you can move forward. It only takes one person in the room to say no, uh, and it gets killed dead, right? Because the need for consensus in large organizations is really common. And this is then the challenge of, in order to drive change and, and cause a shift in mindset, you have to have all those stakeholders engaged. And this is a challenge in terms of defining strategy. The challenge of not being there to find a strategy that everyone can agree with, because by its very definition, that is going to be safe. Therefore, it won't involve risk. It won't actually upset anybody. And this then becomes like a really uh, key impediment. Big organizations suffer another challenge, right? which the guys in the garage don't. And shareholders and regulators and or potentially uh, IP, the protection of IP, and the lawyers actually have a view on this as well, is that uh, when you're a large organization, uh, there's a question of saying, I'm going to go to market with something that's highly sensitive, which is about cannibalizing uh, the very thing that this thing is seen as having a robust um, uh, revenue stream from. <coughs> that if you're going to market with a uh, strategy of cannibalization and early cannibalization, in many markets, this is just not an acceptable story to the market. And I can name three organizations where digital strategies have been produced and have not actually made it to the board yet, right? And have not been published because uh, it's seen as, no, nah, can't go there. So this is actually real. The other dimension is that of the regulators because, of course, the question of the management and access of data then becomes real, whether it's the questions of sovereignty that were raised earlier, but more importantly, uh, privacy and compliance uh, obligations as defined by the regulators. Large corporates are subject to scrutiny in the management of that data and, and the utilization of that data, which, act which uh, you know, small startups are not. And this is, Difficult, difficult to navigate. And another one which is really topical and I've uh, seen revealed recently is uh, the, the management of IP. That, you know, when you inherently 
look at service paradigms that have been created in other markets and then look to reapply them and say, oh, we could do that, you may be falling foul of, uh, of IP uh, opportunities. So then the lawyers inherently need to be involved before you start to push the boat out uh, in some of the strategies. And lastly, this is, this is kind of, um, and I've seen this occur, is this pensiveness of going, if you author a, a uh, disruptive strategy, this is actually a make or break for the author, right? And if it comes out of you know, too few a number of too few people, there is a challenge, right? And that challenge is that if it doesn't fly, you know, if you've put this thing up and sold it, it can be an uneasy feeling being the one in there saying, hey, what about moving forward in this direction? And it doesn't happen. It can actually be, uh, I won't say career limiting, but it can actually be uh, quite an uncomfortable moment. So there's a lot of reasons why in a, in a big organization uh, it's difficult to drive uh, disruption. But there's a really key question is whose job is it anyway? And the sense that in this room, I was struck by uh, when I ran through the delegate list and, and I think there were probably three or four organizations out of you know, some hundreds that uh, where there were more than one delegate. And I think only counted one where there was a CIO and, uh, and the CMO uh, coming together. And the fact that you got a bunch of CIOs and CMOs and CDOs kind of has this notion that it looks like, feels like it's one person's accountability. And it's not, right? Is it because it's impossible for one person to drive and have that strategy, drive it to fruition, take it out, have it accepted, you can't do this alone, right? And whose job it is, is really confusing. And it could be anybody's, frankly, right? And uh, this thing that we see is that there seems to be an isolation challenge for many, uh, depending on the organization. So I just pose it as this uh, open question of, you can't do this alone, and it's not just one person's job. Observations, though. Look, it's probably not uh, a disruptive digital strategy unless someone feels pretty threatened by it, all right? If you're going to shift the game, right, if there is cannibalization involved or you're going to shift the service model of the organization or you're going to create value in a new market, you are going to dis uh, distract and or detract from some other part of the business. Someone will feel threatened. And this goes back to the consensus thing, right? If you've got consensus, it probably means that there's no one upset. If there's no one upset, it's probably not disruptive. So someone should feel pretty threatened uh, in order to actually uh, feel like you're changing the game. Invariably, the board's gonna have to know about it. You know, when I see a uh, digital strategy which goes, yeah, we're right, we've done the digital strategy and we're implementing it now, okay, great. Did you have to go to the board? Well, no, because, you know, it's just, it, it's not a digital strategy. Other, you know, in the context of disruption or transforming the service models, that is in fact actually a, uh, a technology evolution because no one's going to argue. It, it inherently makes sense to put uh, data in the hands of someone traveling out there or it inherently makes sense to be, yeah, instrument something and, uh, and, and improve uh, asset management. So they're the easy ones. Uh, something that uh, involves a lot of uh, either an investment of capital at a level that the board needs to know about it, or secondly, uh, a change in service model the board will want to know. But lastly, you've got to have this mindset, which is that ultimately um, success is not guaranteed, and uh, there's a high probability that you're going to have to come back and look at it, uh, potentially pivot it, have another crack at it, maybe have a plan B, that in some aspects you've got to be prepared to try things, uh, go through that rapid prototyping, and, uh, and you know, have, a, have a second view. So, you know, there's characteristics and uh, these are not often seen. So, if we came back and, you know, tried to rework some of these examples of, uh, you know, we had before, we said, well, look, if I was an airline, you know, what's the thing that's going to encourage me to swipe my badge, you know, on the way through to minimise the number of touch points and do all those things because every time I go to the airport, I've got a different way to walk through. Well, how do I change the experience for me, you've got this whole sense of, well, why aren't I trying to leverage that? 
uh, and the concept of saying, well, fine, if I know you're in the building and I know what time you've arrived and I know when your plane takes off, I'm going to run an auction. I'll run an auction for um, seat upgrades or I'll run an auction to jump the earlier flight and you can spend your frequent flyer points. Or while I'm at it, let's turn frequent flyer points into you know, an alternative to Bitcoin and uh, use them to, as a currency and I can trade them on Forex. You know, the whole concept of saying, let's take something uh, that's you know, an efficiency play and then turn it into experience is real. You know, if I'm a business bank, uh, and there are plenty of them, you know, the concept of saying that, you know, what would I do? Fine, I can make the business banker, you know, more efficient in terms of understanding either the products it can offer or, uh, or, or the uh, characteristics of the uh, client. But in this context, you're saying, well, why aren't we doing something more expansive? Like, let's handle uh, invoicing, like, you know, take out invoice to go. Uh, and therefore we'll handle invoicing, we'll handle the payments and the collections, we'll actually be in the middle of that whole process, as we kind of are anyway, then let's use the data and the analytics to actually look for the risk profile of the uh, small to medium businesses as they're starting up, and then we can actually provide answers to the, uh, to the uh, clients um, uh, in respect of their um, uh, you know, their risk profile. There's a thing here which is that a lot of these services are services we don't like, right? We don't like to fly. We don't like to have a loan. You know, we fear that, you know, the only time we speak to a bank is when they say, well, guess what? You're uh, not meeting your schedule of payments and we'll take your house off you. You have to shift the experience from something that we don't like to an experience we do. I like, um, you know, there's another bank, they're probably here, you know, um, that gamified the whole payment of pocket money, right? This is cool, there's no revenue in this, but this is sort of game changing. Why? Because it introduces organisations to the concept of, uh, introduces kids to the concepts of, let's uh, take uh, our obligation to do jobs for pocket money, I tick it off, I have a, um, a user interface on my smartphone, which every kid under two has, and uh, the whole concept of pocket money is then gamified. There's no money in it, but it creates brand allegiance and it creates an interaction uh, in, and, uh, forces then the parent, if they're going to have this, uh, this app, to actually then uh, run some banking with the institution involved. And the last one is, you know, when you get to sort of gadgets and gadget companies and personal uh, wearable devices, and how you take something which is just a gadget and a device, but it's the data retention, the dashboard and the gamification, and how you gamify walking and turn that into something you can monetize, I reckon that's pretty, uh, pretty clever stuff. Look, the key point here is that in disruption, human experience is king. And I want to talk about this. This is my Uber moment. I'm not going to tell you about it, only because there's a bunch of brands there. And the points I want to make is that in each of these cases, their service models shift the human experience. All right, you know, the question was posed, you know, why? There's no technology innovation necessarily in Uber. But what, what was the story? It shifted the experience. And uh, for all organisations, and you can line up brands to your heart's content, and yes, most of them are, uh, were birthed out of, a, uh, out of a garage somewhere, but the challenge was that they looked at a problem and tackled it differently. I want to talk about um, being human-centred for a second, all right? But before I talk about being human-centred, I want to talk about being customer-centred because there's a lot of that discussion going on in this room. Uh, and, and through some of the working session. There's a difference. To be customer centered, you know, is this concept of saying, I'm gonna put my customer before, you know, product uh, excellence and the cost efficiency, et cetera. You know, we workshop uh, customer experience. Maybe we create journey maps. Uh, we might put in a customer experience council and, you know, look at things to say, how would it impact our customers? Sometimes we even get a focus group together and we'll ask the customers how they feel. This does not actually change an experience. This is actually a pretense. And I differentiate between human-centered and customer-centered only because I think customer-centered has become an overloaded term, right, for people thinking that they're thinking about customers. Human-centered is different, right? And, uh, you know, Deloitte spoke of it earlier and the role of designers and human-centered designers where the concept is you ask about, you know, how do you feel? 
How do you feel when you wake up and you've got to catch an aeroplane? Or before you actually book the ticket? How do you feel when you know you're going in to speak to your banker? I don't like bankers and I don't like aeroplanes. Fine. Hmm, good basis to start. Tell us about an experience you love. There was a great quote earlier in the day, you know, your, your last best experience becomes your benchmark for all other experiences. But the concept about um, asking people about their risks and their fears, their issues, uh, understanding how they feel, the emotions that they go through, engaging with them in a process of co-design so that you can create a new vision for an experience is where design thinking comes to play. This ability to think outside the box, and I too believe in design thinking, and I believe in design thinking in business, because ultimately it starts, and uh, you can read Roger Martin and others in this area, but uh, the concept of understanding and being able to go in with an open mind in terms of building empathy and defining uh, the challenge, understanding the challenge with an interpretation, that ability to ideate and that concept of iterating round and being prepared to cycle round these steps as often as are required is a really key part of uh, this journey of how you build a new service model. So, and uh, borrowing this uh, slide from uh, audio really brings uh, to bear this key, which is for people in this room, and there are CIOs and there are marketing officers and there are people that are probably involved in service design, is that this concept of taking the view of the people, understanding the challenge of people, understanding the business perspective, understanding the technology perspective. These are the, these are the points of understanding how am I gonna change? What would I change and create as a vision? And, and allowing this to uh, exist and create that vision without boundaries, right? Not be stuck. And then run it by the business because then the business has got this question of viability. You know, is this something we could do or, or wanna do and is it aligned to our goals? And then from a technology perspective, which is the role of the CIO, which is to actually then bring along uh, the challenge of uh, feasibility. You know, that whole question of can technology support that vision today? That this confluence has to come together and this is the thing that actually enables you to create a game-changing uh, story uh, for your business. In our world, it's all about co-designing services uh, through the eyes and emotions and needs of the stakeholders. And the stakeholders are not just the customers, by the way, right? Your employees are stakeholders. There's a very uh, this important truth, which is you can't be customer centric and uh, customer centered until you're actually employee centered, because those two go hand in hand. But the, the concept of personas and journey maps are understood. You, but you bring uh, empathy maps, value prop, position canvas, and a, a dozen other tools, and there are ways to look at how you engage with your clients, and this is really key. And then there's a final comment, which is that in our world, just as we heard earlier today that the challenge of bringing design thinking in and bringing right brain thinking people into the world of defining strategy is a real challenge because sometimes that looks like we're just tackling a problem, everybody get ready for this and we'll make it up as we go along. And there aren't many corporates that feel pretty comfortable about running a process that starts like this. And in our world, this changes by wanting to understand motivation and business context, which is, comes from the board down. And the board's got to have a view and the leadership team have to have a view. And to define then uh, the business model, whether you're using Osterwalder's uh, business model canvas or other tools, doesn't matter. But you then go into this question of human-centered design to build a service model, a service catalog that tackles the problems, iterates around but then you get into that, well, so what? What do we do about it now? How do we take this to reality? Because quite often it's going, I've got a crazy vision, but how do we take this forward? Because that's quite often difficult, which is then the role for uh, capability models, which then allow you to understand, well, how do I move the capabilities necessary to build these services aligned to this uh, service model and then build a roadmap? And this then becomes a process for that merging of uh, human-centered design with the traditional uh, structured approach to defining uh, strategy, which tackles the problem that was discussed earlier today. So look, in conclusion, right, some takeouts here. 
you know, ultimately, you should resolve if you're in a space where you need to be disruptive. You know, if you're running in a capital intensive industry and you're running a lot of plant, the chances are you don't. You do just want to instrument and make things efficient. So figure out whether you should be trying to disrupt or transform or merely have an efficiency play. It's okay to be either way, but don't get confused the thinking you're doing one when you're doing the other. It's not one person's job. You have to bring everyone along for the ride. Okay, that journey, that process on the previous slide is about how do you engage the necessary stakeholders and bring everybody through. Everybody needs to agree, even on the tough decisions. You've got to think and act like entrepreneurs. You've got to have, be prepared to say, I will be the guy that's prepared to have a crack at this and be prepared to fail and fail fast. And you have to try and establish an appetite for that in your own business. You've got to be human centric in your service design. If you don't go back to understand uh, the impact uh, for customers and stakeholders, you'll miss out and understand how this is going to shift the experience.